We're back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. I haven't talked to my next guest in a while, and I always look forward to our conversations. Dean Baker is Senior Economist with the Center for Economic and Policy Research. He also writes the Beat the Press column there as elsewhere, and there are a couple topics uh, a very timely right now that I wanted to discuss with him. So, first of all, Dean, as always, good to see you, and thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me on again, Richard. It's been well. Yeah. Um, listen, I wanted to start with your piece on a, 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 a something that was published by a libertarian group, uh, the Niskanen uh, Center, um, which is uh, named after Bill Niskanen, uh, who you describe as the rarest of all creatures in Washington, an honest libertarian. Such people do exist. I've encountered them myself. And, uh, you know, I saw the paper that you wrote about. I was glad to see you take it on. First of all, the pa- paper was entitled Cost Disease Socialism, which I thought was an odd, an oddly constructed phrase. And... Um, what you say about it is you probably back 80 to 90 percent of their their specific proposals, but you were disappointed to uh, you know you expect serious arguments and the framing uh, was something you objected to, meaning I suppose you don't consider it a serious argument. And that is uh, that. Well, first of all, if you could just briefly describe what they mean by uh, cost disease socialism. Yeah, what what I just thought was strange, and you know, I, I've known the people. I knew the people write that wrote this piece. I know so, several of the people at the Niskanen Center. I've had good exchanges with them. I, you know, it's not as though I agree with them on everything, but I think of them mostly as serious people, uh, as I did Bill Niskanen. I, I begin the piece with this story, and it's a hundred percent true. Where I was debating him, I had many debates with him, and you know, I could be kind of belligerent in a debate and. He is going on about, oh, we had 90% tax rate, and then he added up, uh, I don't know what other taxes in there, sales tax, whatever it was. It came to 100%, might have been over, I don't know. And anyhow, I go, well, no one paid that. And then Bill very calmly goes, well, if you have a tax that no one's paying, it's probably not a very good tax. Right. right. You know, I had to shut up for a second, really. Yeah, you got a point. Um, anyhow, point just being, you know, yeah, we have to be self-critical of the stuff we put forward. And generally, you know, again, I, I appreciate that a bill. He, he, we disagreed on many, many things, but he was a serious guy. He didn't just make stuff up. Um, he was anti-imperialist. He always called for cutting the military budget by 50%. He was opposed to the war in Iraq. I mean, these were, you know, good positions, uh, in my view, but anyhow, you know, getting back to the piece at hand, the, what, I, what I objected to in the framing was cost disease socialism. So they're talking about things like, okay, we have people on the left in the U.S. who want to have Medicare for all. Uh, they want to f- uh, free college. Um, they want to um, increase housing affordability. Uh, and and they, they write about this like the people who are proposing these measures haven't thought at all about the cost. And, you know, I've worked with the people who are pushing Medicare for all. They're very hard work serious people they recognize we have to contain costs they have proposals for containing costs they're not just saying oh we're just going to pick up the tab for every you know they're very well aware of the fact that we have to contain costs and of course one of the points they always make is that if you look at the countries that have universal health care germany canada france it doesn't matter pick any of them their costs are way less than the u.s so they want to implement those types of cost controls. Now, you could certainly argue that's not the best way to go. Obviously, there's right. differences even among those countries. But the idea that somehow they aren't aware that you have to contain cost, that's totally a straw man argument. So that, that was my big objection. Again, I think many of the proposals they put forward there, they, they want to... they want to reduce uh, patent uh, uh, monopolies and prescription drugs. They want to have more doctors to get our prices, you know, what we pay our doctors more in line with what we pay in Canada and Europe. These are all very reasonable proposals, and I agree with most of them. But they just kind of pick this straw man and acting like, oh, you have these crazy socialists out there who just want to pay for everything and don't care about what it costs. Yeah, and and, and to me, that, that struck me as being... The ultimate, and I know some of those proposals that they included are especially close to your heart, and uh, I agree with them as well, but uh, it seemed to me to be 
sort of the ultimate cheap shot. It's what a lot of libertarians and conservatives, it's their go-to move, right? Well, uh, you know, I sometimes used to debate those people and so if they said, you just want to throw money at the problem, I would just say, yeah, you know, just to throw them off. But, but I think that it, it overlooks a couple of critical points. One is the one you made that, of course, these proposals not only address cost issues, but in many cases have better cost control measures than what we have today, for sure. Uh, but secondly, you know, I'd love your thoughts on this, and this may be tangential, but what a lot of these discussions seem to leave out is, well, what's the right amount of cost? You know, if we're spending, you know, in a hypothetical universe, five percent of our one percent of our gdp on healthcare, for example well that's way too low so a ten percent or a rather a thousand percent increase might very well be warranted in fact probably would be so but so they always focus it seems to me on trend lines rather than what the appropriate base level is and whether it should be public or private spending you know they count public spending but they don't factor in private spending, a million things like that. So I, I, I thought the disease all, I'm sorry, the piece also, cost disease socialism, also suffered from a bit of that. If I'm remembering it correctly, I don't remember anything addressing, well, what are the appropriate levels of expenditure in these areas? Does that make yeah, any well, sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly when you look at something like healthcare, it's hard to argue we need to spend more there. I mean, we have to no, do of course, more. I mean, but yeah, people yeah, obviously don't get services, but I mean, given we spend so much more than everyone else, um, we should be able to both fill in the gaps, you know, provide the services to people who aren't getting them and also save yeah. money. But say somewhere like child care, where we do spend less than, say, Germany and France, not just public, public and private together. We do have to spend more. People need child care. And, you know, there it's totally appropriate to say, yeah, we, it, it's going to cost us more, more as a society, whether it's public or private. You know, I think almost certainly has to be more public than private. But in any case, point is, as a society, we do need to spend more on child care. We have have to be mindful of the cost. I don't know. I don't have great stories. That I, don't, I don't recall them having any good stories on how to contain costs in child care. I mean, they're saying we have to be mindful, and of course we do. But I mean, the issue with child care, of course, is we need a certain ratio of, uh, of, of teachers for, for kids they're caring for. We can't have, you know, one teacher uh, caring for 20 or 30 kids. That, that just that will save us money, but that's not going to be good child care. So, right. you know, I'm open if you got suggestions how to keep those costs down. But the bottom line is um, it is going to cost us more and you know we don't want to compromise by having you know say unsafe child care where you know you have uh, teachers uh, supervising more kids than they're capable of dealing with and you don't want to uh, balance the budget so to speak of child care by paying people inadequately for providing it which is i would argue one of the problems we have today um it also seems to me that a lot of these and i'd love your thoughts about this dean it, it, it seems to me that a lot of these arguments treat the economy as a static thing and under uh, under calculate for one of the most fundamental economic principles, which is certain things you do in the public sector will uh, create economic growth elsewhere. And while they may be, yes, costly, uh, they may offer some offsetting growth benefits somewhere else in the economy if you have you know more people yeah i, I wouldn't wouldn't put the in this kind of people in that camp but certainly many of the people who are yelling about deficits more generally and this kind of people generally don't i mean they haven't been out there not to say none of them have ever yelled about deficits but they haven't been big deficit hawks but many of the deficit hawks you know you look at uh president biden's proposal they're saying oh well we can't afford you know he wants to have more child care that's nice we can't afford it well you know, that's very direct because one of the, you know, one of the clearest pieces of data we could see over the last three decades is the U.S. is far way behind other countries in female labor force participation. So if you go back to, say, 1980, um, we were near the top. I think that even back then, the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Sweden, they, they were ahead of us in women's labor force participation. But we were ahead of France. We we're ahead of Germany. Um, we, we were near the top. That's no longer true. Those countries are well ahead of us. Even Japan has passed us. I'm beating up on Japan here because it's, it's still, you know, we're 
sexist society, they're even more sexist. But uh, the fact is they actually have higher women's labor force participation than we do. So that's a very direct case. Yeah, we're going to spend more on child care. But what that's going to mean is a lot of women who want to work aren't able to do so now because they can't make arrangements for their kids. Um, if we spent the money on child care, that would be very direct. Now, there's many, many other things. Of course, they're somewhat more indirect, but they could still be very important. And one of the things that's kind of driving me nuts is, you know, we're talking about the debt, the burden of the debt in the context of proposals that include measures on, on, on limiting the effects of global warming. And, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to think of the logic of this. I mean, you think of this, let's imagine 20 or 30 years down the road, we're talking to, you know, our grandchildren or great-grandchildren, whatever it might be, and, and we're saying, oh, oh, you know, look, we paid off the debt for you, and we've destroyed the planet. I mean, what the hell would they say to us? I mean, it's just... You know, what are the trade-offs here? So the idea that, oh, we might have a somewhat higher debt burden that you probably wouldn't even be able to find unless you went looking through the budget books. In other words, in people's lives, you wouldn't even notice it. That's the point I'm making. But, you know, the cost of that is going to be, we're not going to take steps to to try to contain global warming. And you know, the unfortunate part of the story is we've already been so negligent in that area. We're still, even in a best case scenario, going to see horrible, horrible things. But if we just continued on the path we're doing and don't take serious steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we're looking at a horrible future 10, 15, 20 years out. We're both old types. So, you know, maybe we won't even be here, but, you know, there will be people who are alive then. I just don't know how you're going to say, oh, well, them's the breaks. We were worried about the deficit. Right, exactly. And uh, it's so important. And Dean Baker, uh, I want to get to, you know, a critical line in this piece, but just to be clear, uh, and healthcare in a way is its own, I feel like it's its own economy in this country bigger than the entire economy of the UK, if I recall correctly. But um, I wasn't suggesting, uh, I was saying, I was posing a hypothetical, of course, if it was at 1%, we would need to spend more. I certainly don't think we need to spend more now, we just need to spend better. But uh, it's smarter, but uh, uh, the, P, uh, the you then go on to say, you know, uh, the problem is not socialism, the problem, and I'm paraphrasing, the problem is regulations that restrict supply and raise costs. These regulations were not put in place and perpetuated by socialists, but rather by the powerful interest groups that benefit from them. Um, and this, to me, is a critical point. Uh, and I, I thought if you could talk to us a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah. So, you know, picking in healthcare, we're you know, these are probably the clearest examples. You know, it's not socialists that are keeping us from having more doctors. Um, doctors don't want us to have more doctors, you know, so we, we limited the supply of doctors so that, you know, obviously they, they could charge much more. And just so people know, our doctors get paid roughly twice as much, in fact, more than twice as much than what you see for France, Germany, other wealthy countries. And of course, that's an average. So I don't mean to say every doctor's, you know, super rich or anything. I mean, these are averages. Um, and, and I should also point out that tends to be more of the specialists, the cardiologists, the neurologists. Um, our, our, our general practitioners do get paid more as well, but the gap isn't quite as large. Um, other areas, uh, they talked about housing, and, and this is an interesting issue. It's a big issue that in uh, certainly in places like New York and San Francisco and other major cities, we've seen a big run up in house prices. A big factor there is there's not more construction. And why is that? Well, they, you have restrictive zoning. Uh, people make it difficult to build housing. You can't have multifamily units in many areas. So these are th this puts upward pressure on prices, but those aren't socialists who are doing that. So, you know, so again, you can point to many other areas, but in, in no cases that I know of, can you point to socialists? They talk about higher ed. I'll just mention one, you know, again, I'm not going to say this is the major cost driver, but it, but it is a cost driver. If you look at the, at, at least the Ivy Leagues, obviously most schools don't have huge endowments, but the Ivies do, the, you know, Harvard, Yale, the other um, really elite schools, and they actually lose money by having their, their endowments managed by, by uh, hedge funds. And and it's one of the things that's just kind of mind boggling to me because you go, OK, why are you paying these people, the hedge fund managers, many of whom get millions or tens of millions a year to manage these endowments? Why are you paying them to lose money? And, you know, again, I don't have inside information, but my guess is most of them are friends with the, the, the presidents, the top executives at the universities are making the call. But that's not socialism. 
So, you know, so again, obviously it's a much longer list, uh, particularly with higher ed. I mean, that's a relatively small part of the story, but you, you aren't going to find socialists behind these, these costs grown up. So I just thought like, this is totally, uh, you know, a, a straw man argument. You want to beat up on socialists? Well, okay, but this is just silly. Yeah, no, I, 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 that point is very well taken. And before we go somewhat away from this topic, I do have to say, Dean, that I have puzzled considerably over the cost of higher ed in this country, and I, I, I've tried to uh, look into it. it. It feels a little bit like a black box where there are so many moving parts, but it's, and maybe I'm thinking too simplistically, but part of me says, uh, what would happen if we treated public colleges and universities in effect like a public option for higher education, made them free? What would that do? Maybe it wouldn't do anything to the cost of private universities, but uh, all of a sudden, uh, the cost difference between you know fifteen thousand a year and thirty-five thousand a year, just pick two numbers out of a hat, would suddenly become a cost difference, at least per as far as tuition is concerned, between zero and thirty-five thousand. Maybe that would a- apply some downward pressure to the private university costs too i don't know any thoughts on that yeah i think it probably would i mean my view is let's make sure we have you know good public schools you know uh you know you have many you know certainly many states i went to grad school university of michigan very good state system california is a very good state system there are others too i don't mean just single out those two make sure we have good public universities and make them free i mean you know this argument oh do you want bill gates to you know, be able to send his kids. Well, Bill Gates and his kids could use the streets for free too. I mean, it's just, right, you right. know, what we'll get, you know, the, the additional money we're going to get by trying to find, okay, these are the really rich people. We're going to make them pay. Um, that That's kind of trivial. And just, it, it's just a silly, silly argument that, you know, we probably spend more money making them pay than we get from them. Um, but make sure that we have good public universities that are available to people at no cost and, you know, what that probably will mean, I'm, I'm sure the Harvards, the Stanfords, they'll do fine because people, rich people want to send their kids there, basically, because they want right. them to get a Harvard degree. And, and I don't care. I mean, it's, you know, OK, you want to spend, I don't know what they charge these days, 55, 60,000 a year. Two, you know, it's huge. You know, and there's some people could afford it if they, they want to pay that. I don't care. Um, you know, you'll have a lot of schools that aren't Harvard and Yale that probably won't be able to compete. Some of them might try to charge lower tuition and find ways to stay in business. Some won't. And, you know, that's, uh, I mean, people lose their jobs. I mean, it's unfortunate, but, you know, if you're expanding the public universities, which you will be if they're free, then people get hired there. Again, it's not like everyone's going to come out okay. So I want to tell a hunky dory story. There's not going to be someone who's working at this or that school 25 years and suddenly it went under and they're too young to retire and they can't really get a job elsewhere because, you know, whatever. There'll be those situations, but that's not a reason not to have free college. So, uh, you know, again, I, I'm less worried if Harvard and Yale keep charging crazy tuitions. You know, they will have some scholarship slots and that's great. But I think the main thing is where are most people going to go? And that's about having good public universities that are free. Yeah. And I would only add to that, Dean, that uh, yeah, we, we let Bill Gates' children go to elementary and high school for free if they want, which mostly they don't at that income bracket, but they can go to public schools for free. I guess the counter argument is, do you want to charge $60,000 a year to go to elementary school uh, for every person in this country? So it, I agree with you. It's a specious argument, but there's a transition here too. I think from the, um, you pronounced it correctly, but from the, uh, is it Niskanen's? Nis- Niskanen. Niskanen Center, um, study to a couple other pieces you've written recently and the, and that is when it comes to health care the cost drivers of we've talked about doctors and uh of course insurance company private insurance companies that's uh, sort of implied and the other piece is uh pharmacy uh the, the pharmaceutical area the pharmaceutical industry and uh you recently wrote a piece uh with an on a I would say a fairly straightforward uh, headline on CPE, CEPR.net, evildoers, the pharmaceutical industry and the pandemic. And I think, you know, uh, first of all, I think your long-term argument is catching on and has spread considerably now in the public debate, which is 
patents for medications are not uh, sort of God-given principle of how the world works or innate like gravity. Patents for pharmaceuticals are something we as a government, as a matter of policy, decided to grant to pharmaceutical companies who then use them not only to become ridiculously wealthy, but as a, I guess, a side, a side effect of that ambition, uh, harm and kill people every year. Is that overstating the case? No, I think it's very accurate. And of course, we're seeing that with the pandemic that, you know, we, we've been so slow in getting vaccines around the world. Of course, we, there, there was a rush and that, that was good to get people in the U.S. vaccinated, particularly after Biden came into office in January. He took it very seriously. We should get people vaccinated as quickly as possible. And at this point, obviously, it's on the demand side. Anyone who wants to get a vaccine can get it. That's not an issue. I, mean, I understand people have travel constraints, this and that, but the problem is not a lack of vaccines. So, so that's great. But in much of the developing world, people still aren't vaccinated, particularly sub-Saharan Africa. Africa, where um, I've seen different numbers, but I think it's safe to say less than 10% of the population is vaccinated. In many areas, even healthcare workers aren't vaccinated. Right. And, and, and that's really an outrage. And the point, you know, or one of the points I'm making there is that we could have produced much more vaccines. So it's a, see, people treat it as a zero sum. Oh, so who in the U.S. didn't you want to have vaccinated? That's not really the issue. I mean, we could get to those stories, but that's not really the issue. The point was that we could have produced many more vaccines. And what what I argued for, you know, really from the start is we should have open sourced this technology from the very beginning. We paid for much of it anyhow. So these companies are all saying, oh, you want to take our technology? Well, guess what? We paid for it. So particularly with Moderna, we paid basically the full cost of their developing the vaccine. We paid them about $450 million for, for their basic research, their, their research in developing the vaccine, and then the first phase one, phase two testing. These are smaller tests to see that it's safe and evidence of effectiveness. And then we paid them another $450 million to do large-scale phase three testing, the clinical trial that the FDA relied on to, to ultimately approve that. Um, we also paid for much of the development uh, of the mRNA technology that, you know, of course, they've used, they have used, Pfizer used, and turns out to be great technology, and these are very effective vaccines. So what I argued for was from the word go, we should have had all of this fully public, you know, so that engineer scientists around the world could see it and benefit from it. So they could also look to produce it and, and manufacture it, not just obviously in the United States, but, but in South Africa and India and Brazil. I, I've debated people on this and they go, oh, well, not, a, you know, not everyone has sophisticated facilities. Well, actually, they do. Now, everyone doesn't. I mean, you have poor countries don't have sophisticated manufacturing facilities, but India is, in fact, the biggest manufacturer of pharmaceuticals in the world. They have plenty of sophisticated facilities. Brazil has sophisticated, you know, there are many countries in the developing world. And, you know, again, they say, oh, well, it's not like they could just turn around and produce it tomorrow. I go, no, they could just turn around and produce it tomorrow. But if they had 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 access to the technology back in early 2020, they could be producing it today. And the, our failure to have gotten these vaccines around the world more quickly has literally let, meant millions of deaths. I mean, if you, you could look at the, the official numbers, and I think we're about 4.6, 4.7 million. I'm not sure that where we stand today, but somewhere in that neighborhood. But there's been analyses. We know these are gross understatements. And there was uh, Center for Global Development, the analysis of excess deaths in India. So this is kind of a morbid concept, but we know how many people die in a typical right. year. So then you go, okay, well, how many more people died in 220, 221 than you would expect? And in India, it comes to between three and a half and four million. So if you look at their official numbers that are published, I think it's like 450, 460,000, which is already horrible, but you know, it actually could be around eight times as much. So, and it's, mm-hmm. Similar story, Brazil, other countries, you know, just horrible, horrible numbers of deaths, many of which, most of which could have been avoided if we'd gotten these vaccines out much more quickly. So this is this is a really big deal. These were preventable deaths. We could have open sourced the, the, the technology and gotten them out much more quickly. I'll also add... And you, you know, know by I, the way, Dean, I'm sorry to interrupt Dean Baker, but uh, I also want to add, since I've run up against that argument too, I, I find it... it incredibly patronizing i find you know what you're really what they're really saying is oh we're not doing this uh to protect drug company profits we're doing this for your own good and the millions of deaths it was for your own good because we didn't think you could manufacture these 
these vaccines properly. I, I, I also have a visceral negative reaction to that. Yeah, it's it's an incredibly condescending and dishonest argument. I mean, the AstraZeneca vaccine was being manufactured in South, is being manufactured in South Africa. They were required to export it. That that was what their contract said. So you have people in South Africa who didn't have access to the vaccine. They were literally manufacturing it there, but then they would export it to Europe because that was who ostensibly owned it. So it it's you know this idea that they don't have the ability. Also, I mean, this is one of the things I get kicks bad term, but you know kind of put it in your face on this they're they're acting like oh we're no we know all of this the the pfizer you know that we have the best experts no one else could do anything well let's look at pfizer's track record this is just what's known publicly i don't have any access to inside data so in february uh, of this year they said oh you know what we found a way that we could adjust our manufacturing and cut our manufacturing time in half well that's fantastic but maybe if you had open sourced it and this information were available a year earlier, maybe someone else would have figured that out. Yeah. You know, and, and it goes, it gets worse. They didn't realize they were, they thought their vaccines have to be super frozen, 94 degrees, minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit. That's difficult. You need special freezers for that. My freezer right. won't go that low. It turns out that for periods of up to two weeks, you can keep it in a normal freezer. And for, you know, for developing countries that even for rich countries, I mean, you know, it's we, we have to have special storage facilities to allow for them to be be transported. They didn't know that. And and the best one or best one, worst one, however you want to put it, when they were originally distributing their vaccines, they were saying that there were five doses in, in their standard vial. Turned out there were six and some of them at seven. So that meant we were throwing out one sixth of the vaccines because the geniuses at Pfizer didn't realize that they actually had six doses in a vial rather than, than five. So, you know, again, I, I don't knock these people. I'm sure they're all hardworking, smart people. But if you had more eyes on the process, we might have found this out much sooner. And that would have meant more vaccines and saved lives. Yeah, it's it's such an important point. And by the way, my attitude is, uh, OK, we funded Moderna, so we shouldn't have given the patent to them anyway. But we do that over and over again. We funded the research. Uh, with a uh, BioNTech, I guess originally with um, with Pfizer, even if we wanted to, I would think we could have said, you know what, uh, whatever you paid in R and D to create this, we'll give you that plus fifteen percent markup, so you earn a profit on it. Now let's do what we need. It would be a lot more effective way to get this out there uh, and to share it with the world. Uh, and you also have suggested, Dean uh, Baker. Uh, that Biden, Joe Biden, President Biden, could transfer the technology, uh, maybe using marching rights. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong about that. But uh, uh, let them fight. Let the uh, drug companies challenge it in court if they want to. But in the meantime, get the. Am I mischaracterizing your your uh, uh, your yes. piece on that? So, so one of the issues that comes up with, 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 you know, particularly the mRNA technologies is that they have novel manufacturing processes that they, they hold as industrial secrets. So this is different from a patent. So if you have a patent, then there's something that's out there and they're saying, oh, you can't use this technology because we have a patent right to it. And that, you know, as I said, there's margin rights, there's section 1498 of the commercial code that allows the, the, the president, the government to open ride a patent required that it be licensed but industrial secrets are somewhat different issues so the question is okay can you tell can you force pfizer to share its manufacturing technology with you know you know the whole world say and you know again you get arguable issues and what what's been said in the reporting is oh if they tried to force them it'd be tied up in court it could take years so i said well we can go the other way around so rather right. than asking pfizer and we offer i mean it makes sense you know just what you're you're saying, you know, okay, how much did it cost you? We'll give you 15%, we'll give you 20%, whatever, above that, you know. So so make sure that they're still getting a profit, they don't have anything to complain about, but they, they just say no. So then we go, okay, you have people who work for you, who know this technology, and we're going to pay them. We're going to pay them $2 million a month. We'll pay them $3 million a month. I don't know, whatever, you know, something will be very right. lucrative. And they're going to go, oh, they can't do it because we have non-disclosure agreements. We'll go, fine, sue them, we'll cover the cost. And I'm willing to bet that you'll have people at Pfizer and Moderna, the other companies, who say, well, $2 million a month isn't bad. And probably some of them care about saving lives. 
So, you know, right. if, if, if they're protected from their non-disclosure agreement, the government's picking up the cost. My guess is you'll get people to do that and then let Pfizer and Moderna file the suits and tell, the, tell us how they care about humanity and saving lives. So so it's there are ways around this. They're, they're basically they're, they're, they're blowing smoke. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And it also shows that if we have the will, we really, well, then we, there's a way. Dean, if you have another couple minutes, and tell me if you don't, sure. but sure. if you, there's one other piece I, uh, that you wrote that I, I really want to get to before you leave, and that is, entitled, this is the uh, piece entitled Saving $3.5 trillion. We know that's the magic number that the Biden administration is going for. Saving three point five trillion on pres- prescription drugs to pay for Bernie Sanders' big agenda, uh, and ba- basically you're saying uh, that arguably the full cost of that three point five trillion dollars—that's one point two percent of GDP—could be covered by savings on prescription drugs. Uh, really interesting. How could we do that? Well, people don't realize both how much we spend on prescription drugs. When I'm saying people, I mean like people in policy debates. I'm not just grabbing someone I met in you know line at the airport or whatever. People in policy right. debates don't realize how much we spend on prescription drugs and also how cheap they actually are to manufacture and distribute. So if you look at the latest data, we're on a path to spend about $500 billion this year on prescription drugs. It's about 2.2, 2.3% of GDP or about $1,700 for literally every person in the country. So it's a lot of money. And then you go, okay, suppose we had no patents or related protections because there's other patent-like protections. Suppose we snapped our fingers, we got rid of all, all those. So what would it cost us to manufacture and distribute them? And I'd give you a ballpark number, probably around the order of $80 billion. And what I'm basing that on is we know what generics cost relative to brand drugs. Generics cost about 5% of the price of a brand drug. So in other words, we have a drug today that's patent protected by Pfizer, by Merck, whoever it might be. Let's go out five years, 10 years, patents expired, generics are in the industry. It's going to cost about 5% as much. And sometimes less. And again, we could we, we know this again based on generics, but also you have countries that don't have patent protection for some of the drugs we have. So uh, one of the big drugs, I think it's cost less now because I'm not even sure if its patent has expired, but Sovati, which is this big breakthrough drug with hepatitis C, it was a great drug because it cured it. Previously, we didn't have cures. It was being sold for 84000 a year for a prescription. You had high quality generics. Again, India pr- produces generics. Some of them are bad. I'm not going to say that but you know they produce generics sold all over the world there they do it for our drug companies so you know we're, we're getting indian drugs so don't get worried that oh my god india doesn't you know they're giving us bad drugs right. they'd sell savati generic versions for three hundred dollars per year's treatment so three hundred dollars versus eighty four thousand so what i'm saying we could we could produce the same drugs for eighty thousand a year that's not a crazy number it's a rough number but it's not a crazy number so the difference there is 420 billion a year so carry that out 10 years, you're talking about 4.2 billion. So, trillion. I mean, 4.2 trillion, I'm sorry, dropping my, right. getting my numbers mixed up here, but you know. <laughs> That's what I'm here for, Dean. Uh, so ahead, so the point is that you could literally talk about saving that much. Now, I don't envision that, it, I'm not expecting that you would have, you know, the they would basically get rid of patents tomorrow and, you know, we would see those sorts of savings. But the point is the potential savings on prescription drugs are absolutely enormous. So I would certainly hope that we would see very large savings there. And I would also add one other factor that, you know, again, it just amazes me people haven't jumped on this. When you have very high drug prices, you're giving drug companies the incentive to push their drugs. I mean, that's almost definitional, right? You know, if you could sell something for eighty-four thousand, that cost you three hundred dollars to manufacture and distribute. You have a really big incentive to, to push that. Well, that's a really perverse incentive. And if we need an example, if that sounds strange, have you heard of the opioid crisis? Okay, the right. whole story of the opioid crisis and. You know, Purdue Pharma, Johnson & Johnson, I mean, Abbott, the third one, they all paid billions of dollars in settlements over the accusation that they misled doctors about the addictiveness of their gen- the new generation of opioids. And just to be clear, it's not that they were mistaken. The accusation was that they knew they were highly addictive, but they claimed that they were not in order to increase their sales. So you get that incentive 
by virtue of the fact that you could charge ridiculous prices if they're being sold as cheap generics. I mean, it's not that everyone suddenly becomes honest. It's just that you don't have much incentive. You know, if you're selling paper plates that, you know, everyone's got paper plates, you know, you make a profit on it, but you're making the same profit everyone else does. It's not a big deal. You're not going to make up all sorts of lies to push your paper plates in ways that might be dangerous to people. It just wouldn't make sense. And, you know, again, so this is the perverse incentive that we create with patent monopolies on prescription drugs. And first of all, I'd like to see a deficit hawk in Washington say, you know, I love the patent system, but we just can't afford it anymore. Uh, we need to save the $4.2 trillion. That would be a novel approach. And secondly, Dean, uh, I don't suppose you would embrace my proposal, which is that every drug executive that promoted opioids should be treated like people trying to smuggle drugs in through the border. They should have their homes and cars impounded and uh, as drug dealers, and uh, perhaps the homes could be used as rehabs and you know, the well, cars. Well, certainly, to... you know, again, that, that's sort of deliberate lie that you know is going to affect people's health. I mean, that's... Yeah. That's, uh, you should pay a big price if you did that, not just get a slap on the wrist. I mean, that's... It, it yeah. was a really big deal. Yeah, it sure was. and costs countless hundreds of thousands of lives. So, unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to leave it there, but Dean Baker has always great insights. So, I appreciate you, pub first of all, publishing them at CEPR.net, and secondly, thanks so much for coming back on the program to talk thanks about it. Thanks for having me on again, Richard. I really enjoyed it. Uh, same here. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Eskow, and this is The Zero Hour.